He was an AFL captain before his 21st birthday, the youngest in VFL AFL history. Sadly, he was effectively finished as an AFL player at 22. That's a brutal assessment, Jack Trengove, but there's no other conclusion, is there? Welcome. Thanks for having me, Mike. Um, yeah, probably a bit brutal, but uh, probably pretty true at the same time. Well, you played 79 games in your first four seasons. You played 10 more in your career, another six seasons. That must have been terribly frustrating for you. Yeah, no doubt. Um, it's one of those things that my career obviously went on a few, a bit of a roller coaster. And um, from the outset, I was so lucky and so fortunate to play some games um, in my first year and get some sort of early success. And then to sort of come down with various injuries and um, have the thing that you love doing and I guess your livelihood at that time taken away from you. Um, it was it was extremely difficult, but um, that is the AFL industry. It can be brutal for some, lucky for others, and um, I guess it's all, all a part of it. Now, I must say, I'd never heard of the navicular bone until Jimmy Hurd was cut down in the early 90s, but that was your affliction, wasn't it? It was, yeah, and to be honest, I'd never heard of it either. <laughs> um, unfortunately, from an anatomy point of view, it's um, a tiny little bone in your foot um, that's sort of right in the ankle joint and it takes a lot of the force just from walking and jogging and running. Um, and if you get a little fracture in that, it pretty much just compresses and creates this sort of dull pain where you lose all sorts of power. And um, yeah, I, I guess it, it's a hard thing to describe to others that haven't, um, I guess, felt that feeling before, but all the other, um, members out there that are a part of the navicular club, so to speak. Um, it's not much fun. And yeah, it really does just hamper you and stops you from being able to do sort of everyday activities. And um, I guess your feet are pretty important in the game of football. So um, it certainly did take its toll and extremely frustrating. But um, as I've sort of alluded to, it's, it's the nature of the game at times and injuries are a big part of it. And unfortunately, um, it hit me pretty hard. Jack, are you completely over it or is it something you're going to have to live with for the rest of your life? I think, yeah, it's one of those things that the reality is I'll have to live with it for the rest of my life. Um, you know, every morning I wake up out of bed and that first step, you're always a bit apprehensive as to how it's going to feel. But touch wood, it's been fantastic um, for the last couple of years and I'm sort of figuring out more and more what I can and can't get away with. But there's no doubt that it's going to be an ongoing issue long term and I'm... Well, most likely have quite a bit of arthritis in that joint sort of into the longer term, but um, it's not stopping me from doing anything that I want to right now, so I just hope it remains that way. I want to ask you about uh, your sister Jess, world-class marathon runner, dual Olympian, and pounds the roads every day uh, with no apparent ill effect. You feel a bit cheated? <laughs> no, I never cheated. Um, Jess, yeah, she's an absolute inspiration to me and the rest of our family. Um, what she goes through and has to endure to get to where she wants to get to is, um, yeah, seriously incredible. And, yeah, now that um, I'm out of the system, she's trying to get me out more and more with her running. And if uh, she had her way, she'd turn me into a marathon runner as well. But <laughs> I feel like that's still a bit away for me. But, um, no, I'm, as I said, I'm incredibly inspired by Jess. and what she's had to go through to sort of reach different Commonwealth Games and Olympics and um, various things for, for the little reward, I guess, from a monetary point of view. Um, I'm mesmerised by a lot of those athletes that train just as hard, if not harder, than a lot of others and, um, you know, all for one event every four years. Mm. It's, it's tough going, but um, she's incredible to watch. The captaincy, Jack. You were 20 years and 181 days old when you and Jack Grimes became the co-captains at Melbourne. I mean, it's staggering to me, having seen so much footy and still looking back, that someone so young was entrusted with a leadership role at a footy club. Was it the wrong decision? Uh, it's probably easy to sit here and say that it was the wrong decision now, um, given what transpired. But, you know, to, to go back into that exact time, um, there was a lot going on at the footy club. Dean Bailey had just been sacked. Um, we're trying to sort of create and develop this young culture coming through at the Melbourne Footy Club who were dying for some, some success. And Mark Neal came in 
um, wanted to sort of set the tone early and um, take the club in a new direction. And, you know, I just went about the pre-season as I normally would and was, you know, head down, bum up attitude and really trying to work hard and um, trying to help the team where I could and help that development process. And, um, you know, Neildy came knocking on the door one day and sort of said that, you know, we'd gone through the leadership voting and your teammates and the coaches believe that you and Jack are the, the best guys for the job. So, you know, I didn't give me much time to really think about it. I just, I'm that type of attitude that if, you know, my friends and teammates and coaches, those that I trust, want me to be the person to stand up at that time, then I was going to give it everything I could. So um, I wouldn't have changed it for anything. And the things that I've learnt throughout that time um, have made me the person that I am today. You know, lots of adversity and challenges along the way, but I loved every second of it, as, as weird as that might sound, and very proud that I can sit back now and say that I captained the Melbourne Footy Club, um, you know, the oldest club in the land and with such a rich history. Um, it's easy to, yeah, as I said, sit here and say that things could have gone a different direction and no doubt I would have loved to have been standing up there in the last day of September holding up the Premiership Cup as captain of the Melbourne Footy Club and give that Melbourne community, you know, the success that they um, really do deserve. But um, unfortunately, it didn't pan out that way. And um, I look back sort of, I guess, envious of what could have been. But at the same time, um, I learnt so much about myself during that period. I think everyone at Melbourne says, even retrospectively, that your leadership quality stood out when you came here, came across to Melbourne from South Australia. And that part I don't question, but I just thought you've got... You're playing with Brad Green. He stayed at the footy club after being having the captaincy removed. Nathan Jones, lots of senior players. Brent Maloney, they were all there at the time and they were so much older than you. And I just, Was it uncomfortable when you realised that you were going to be their leader? Yeah, Mike, that was, that was definitely the hardest part about it all and the thing that took me the longest to come to grips with is... Um, I've grown up with that mentality that, you know, respect the elders and earn yeah. your trust and respect. And, you know, I came into the Melbourne Footy Club with, you know, some great leaders around in James McDonald, Green, as you said, Brent Maloney, Nathan Jones, Brad Miller, Cameron Bruce. And um, to be thrown sort of the captaincy in my going into my third season and um, suddenly I'm talking to those older and more senior experienced players and, and leading them was certainly uncomfortable at the start, but they did give me a lot of confidence that I was the right man for the job and they were really willing to back me in, um, which made it a lot easier. But, yeah, no doubt that was all part of the challenge and I guess when you're having to have those really hard conversations with more senior and more experienced players than yourself, it is um, extremely challenging and... Um, yeah, I think we could have gone, you know, in various different ways from there, but um, the decisions were made and I just tried to really make the most of it. And I think probably the only regret that I have throughout that whole time and I guess the biggest learning I've got from leadership and going through as captain of the Melbourne Football Club is I probably neglected my own game and I think that was the biggest criticism um, from me and this is going to... I hope this doesn't come across as arrogant, but... My biggest criticism was that I was too selfless and I was too worried about the team and um, getting success for the team and worried about my teammates and probably did neglect my own individual game, which probably hurt my own development. And I think that's the thing that I sort of pass on to leaders now and others that have sort of come for advice since, is that you've really got to take care of your own uh, individual game first. That is the biggest priority and that helps the team sort of lift to the next level and that's probably the greatest learning that I got from that time. I can understand that and it's a fair assessment because at the end of 2011, uh, which was your second year, you'd finished fifth in the best and fairest, you'd had an excellent season in every respect, uh, your leadership qualities were obvious to everyone at Melbourne and in fact someone in the AFL media guide likened you to Jimmy Bartell, so it was a very rosy picture at the time, wasn't it? Yeah, and I guess... Yeah, I had, as I sort of alluded to, I had some early success and was able to play a lot of games and get some continuity and really felt like I belonged and believed that I could play at the top level and, um, you know, be a really good player at that level. And, you know, to, to come out of, you know, 2011 when we were going OK, um, you know, we were sort of 
knocking on the door of the top eight and then we had that episode down in Geelong where, which led to the sacking of Bales, which was a really tough period for the club. And then to sort of have everything flipped upside down and sort of start again. And then the next two years were really challenging. So I went from sort of having, um, you know, a really successful start to, to going through some pretty tough times. So quite a stark difference, but um, it certainly uh, made me a lot more resilient. Gee, the, the Geelong game turned the club on its head, didn't it? I remember that vividly. In fact, I was working for the Herald Sun and I wrote some stuff that I'm not sure Don McClarty's still forgiven me for, but it was just... I think it was just almost the, the cr final blow for Melbourne supporters about the progress of the footy club. Definitely, and as I sort of said, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we were about ninth or 10th at the time and we were a serious finals chance and things were going OK, but as you said, when you sort of go down Geelong and you're playing against an absolute legend sort of team of the competition at that time and throughout that period. And we were literally just witches hats out there on that day. And, um, you know, we learnt a very hard lesson. And um, I guess my biggest regret out of all of that is that the person that takes, um, takes it all on board and I guess cops it the most is the coach. And, um, you know, I, I love Bales's as a coach and he's the fav my favourite coach that I've had over my journey and um, have so much respect for him and to see him have to fall on a knife for, for our efforts out on the ground was really tough from a player's point of view and I think a lot of boys sort of lost belief when sort of he left and um, then we moved forward and away from him because everyone had a really strong relationship with Bales so um, yeah it was, it was really tough and a tough pill to swallow but you never want to lose by 180 points or whatever it was, but it certainly was a turning point at the club. Jack, 2014, you play the first two games, you get 44 possessions in those games and then we don't see you for two years. What Did anything specific happen in that round two game or did you just decide that you had to try to get the foot right? Yeah, it was a bit of that. So, um, as I sort of said, that was Ruzi's first year, so um, went through another tumultuous time with another sort of coach change and... Um, you know, went into the pre-season that year. I'd um, pretty much not run at all and been off feet my whole off-season because of my foot. And it was feeling pretty good. So I had a crack at the pre-season and was running as good as I'd ran for a long time and um, hitting some certain PBs and extremely excited about what that year had for us with sort of Rusey on board and the, the club going in a new direction. and. Um, yeah, as I sort of alluded to earlier, that dull pain came back and um, I just wasn't able to do what I knew that I was capable of from my body point of view and something had to give so, you know, I put my hand up and said that it just, whatever is happening right now isn't working for me and that's where we had further scans and realised that there was that substantial crack in the navicular bone which would require surgery so... Um, you know, it's just one of those points in time where I was like, something needs to change because, yeah, it was really affecting my own sort of, I guess, mental side and um, the positivity wasn't there because I was doubting if I could play at that level and it was really affecting me. So, um, you know, there was certainly an issue there that we had to fix. I was going to ask you about the emotional toll. It clearly had to apply. I mean, you're so young, you came in on such a positive note. What was the low point of that sort of recovery period, as it were? Yeah, a lot of players and different people go through low points of their life, and that was probably the lowest point for me. Um, I guess when you see all your teammates going out and we've all got the same sort of goal to sort of get the ultimate success, and you can't really contribute to that because you're stuck in the gym swimming laps of the pool or riding on a stationary bike and doing your rehab, it, um, it is really hard to deal with. But at the same time, it's going to sound completely stupid and backwards, but I'm so grateful for going through that those times as well because it's made me a much more well-rounded person and I see myself so lucky to have, um, I guess, witnessed some adversity early on in my career that's really set me up for later in life. and. Um, an example of that is I knew that I was out for the rest of the season, so it gave me a chance to sort of flick my mindset and get thinking about, you know, what's going to be my next career after footy because up until that point, um, you know, I was, I was hoping to be able to play a really long and successful career in the AFL, but 
an injury such as this came along, maybe that dream wouldn't be the reality. So, you know, I, I was able to sort of go away and work on my commerce degree and prepare myself for when that sort of footy career comes to an end. And I'm so grateful to have been able to do that now. And I think the whole situation just gave me a lot more perspective on life. And I've realised that footy wasn't actually everything and there was a whole other life out there. And um, it made me appreciate all those little things a lot more, having sort of been dealt a bit of adversity. It's a brilliant attitude. And I've said this to you before, but I just admire your honesty and, and, and taking the positivity out of that. Now, let me take you back to the 2009 draft. Melbourne has the first two choices. Melbourne takes uh, Tom Scully and Jack Trengove. Do you remember who went to three? Dusty Martin, I reckon. <laughs> That's him? Right. The rich and yeah. in number four. That's yeah. the one. He's, he's but but, but to be fair, career, to be fair, at that time, I know Melbourne would, were wrapped to get you. I mean, you'd, pl you'd played, I think, in Sturt's grand final team the previous year, correct? Yeah, I did, yeah. And, and kicked six goals in the prelim final? Uh, I don't know, it gets... Uh, goals added to that uh, final every year. <laughs> oh, so you we, kicked uh, one, did you? On, but, <laughs> no, I was. Um, I, I played on the wing for Sturt, and um, yeah, was lucky enough to sort of get some finals exposure at, at the senior level um, towards the end of that year, and slipped through in the prelim and um, played half decent, and you know got a crack in the grand final, which we unfortunately lost at the time. But um, yeah, all great memories. Rusey told me, I had a, a chat to him um, this week, Rusey told me that uh, your tapes are unbelievably good when you were young. Uh, he said you had this innate ability to find the footy, but thought that the foot injury might have be, um, put the focus on pace, which you probably weren't naturally endowed with a lot of pace, were you? No, I think um, the Trango family certainly have more slow twitch muscle fibres than fast twitch muscle fibres. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, it's something that probably early on in my career I didn't have much of an issue with. Um, I was quick enough to sort of get by, but I think the foot injury probably did um, affect it um, along the way. And I think when you, you I was non-weight bearing for sort of 12 weeks, so all the muscles and everything in your leg just sort of disappear and um, to sort of build that up again and then go through it again, it um, certainly takes its toll. and. You know, it's my left leg, so it's not like I'm kicking with it, but it's your jumping leg and you just lose that real power. And um, I probably just tried to sort of put that to the side and not believe it, but um, over time it probably did just um, wear me down and I did realise that I was losing a lot of those physical capabilities that I used to be able to do when I was sort of 20 years old, which was um, probably the most frustrating part about the whole injury. Jack, you ended up going to Port Adelaide for a couple of years and playing three games. Did you nearly go to Richmond along the way? I did, yeah. So um, I think it was back in the end of 2014. So I just had the surgery for that year and was sort of getting to the back end of that year and coming back um, from that injury. And um, Rosie actually gave me a call one day in the off season and sort of said that, Richmond had asked the question um, that they were pretty keen to get me over and I should have a look at the options. And at that point in time, I was, um, you know, just a Melbourne diehard and just wanted, you know, to get that success that everyone at the Melbourne Footy Club was seeking. So then Rosie sort of put that idea in my head, which sort of put me on the back foot and it was, it was pretty hard to cop at the time. But um, when your coach is telling you to sort of look at mm. various options, you've you've got to do it and that's the industry that we played in and um, the next morning I, I went over to Punt Road and Dimmer Hardwick at the time sort of you know welcomed me there and all the senior players and other coaches were there and um, sort, of, sort of showed me a presentation and you know they really valued me and wanted me to be a starting midfielder for them and it was pretty hard to say no to so um, I went downstairs and, and had a medical and this is, as I said, when I was coming back from my foot and this was the moment that I realised that the screws that had been put into my navicular had actually cracked through the screws. Um, really? I was doing the medical and really struggling just to hop on the spot. So we got sent for some more scans and I'd walked away assuming that I was going to be a Richmond player um, the following day, but unfortunately the, uh, the scan came back and there were some pretty nasty cracks through the screws and... I had to repeat the whole process again, so 
um, yeah, one of those sort of sliding doors moments. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was, I was willing to go to Richmond at that time because of the circumstances dealt to me at Melbourne. But at the same time, I was really grateful to go back to Melbourne and um, continue my career there. And um, unfortunately, it meant that I missed another 12 months, which was very difficult at the time. But um, yeah, it's, that's the, the footy industry itself these days. And I guess every club really needs to, they focus on taking care of the club itself and what that looks like in the future. And sometimes players are put up on the chopping block as a result. Do you remember your feeling, the psychological, your, your, your mental well-being when you walked out of Punt Road, knew that your foot wasn't right and knew that the opportunity that sort of was suddenly taken away from you? Yeah, I do. Um, we actually... So I was born and bred in Narracourt in South Australia and um, that night after the Richmond meeting, my um, partner and I were driving across to catch up with my family and it was a long drive over to Narracourt, a good five and a half hours to sort of, I guess, reflect and think about everything. And um, yeah, no doubt there was some sort of pretty sad thoughts going through my head. But at the same time, um, as I've sort of said, I'm just so grateful at the same time. I think, you know, the perspective in terms of what I really value now has changed a hell of a lot from when I was 20 years old. And at that point in time, all I really cared about was that I had a healthy family. I was healthy myself, a loving family, um, you know, great friends and sort of everyone around me was fit and healthy. And that's all that I really care about these days. And um, I think a lot of athletes and footballers in particular can get sort of caught up in their own little bubbles and in the footy world that that's all that really matters. But um, I guess the greatest thing about being injured and going through adversity is it does really make you sort of sit back and reflect about what you really value in life. And I always just kept going back to those things and realising that I do have nothing to complain about because all those things are lining up for me. And as I said, I was, while my foot was a bit of a pain at the time, there were a lot of other worse things going on in people's lives. So I had no right to complain. And um, I'm certainly a glass half full type of person and just looked at what the next opportunity was as a result of um, the cards that I, would de I was dealt. So um, always try to look at things in a positive manner. You're not supposed to be this mature at 29, Jack. That's a statement, not a question. I want to ask you about um, Jack Grimes was your co-captain. He was... Uh, that decision was made when Jack was 22. Did it have a negative effect on him, do you think? Yeah, probably have to ask him the question as well, but I think, you know, him and I are probably pretty similar. Um, it was no doubt tough becoming captain at that time of the footy club. Um, and there were some other things that were going on along the journey as well, which didn't make it any easier. I remember before we'd even um, ran out for the first time, uh, the legend Jim Steins passed away, which really hit us hard because we had such a strong relationship with him. Um, and there were other things that were just happening in a neg negative way at the footy club, which was really tough to deal with, as well as going out there and trying to get performances every week. And, um, it does weigh heavily on you and Jack and I both took responsibility because we were captains at the time and were in charge of really taking this club forward and, um, you know, we were really struggling to do that. So um, it probably does affect your, your own individual career and I'm sure Jack would probably stand back now and um, admit that. But at the same time, we had no other option and we were just trying to do the best we could in um, what were pretty difficult situations. You mentioned before about your studies, um, that you're, that was the, probably the silver lining along the way. You're in finance now, are you not? I am, yeah. So definitely the silver lining in it all is, as I said, it made me sort of knuckle down and finish off my commerce degree and then I was able to use the last couple of years to um, gain some work experience. So I'm now an equities analyst at Lanyon Asset Management, we're a funds management firm based here in Adelaide and manage a little over $360 million. And um, I've actually been able to combine um, the two passions in my life, which is sort of the stock market as, as well as dealing with um, elite athletes. And I've been able to create a new fund, the Lanyon Elite Athlete Fund, which is set up specifically for past and present elite athletes. And I think I learned throughout my footy journey that 
Um, a lot of athletes sort of, um, you know, get paid quite good money from a young age and, um, you know, they get to the end of their careers and don't have much to show for it. So I'm trying to bridge that gap and help them capitalise on that wealth from a young age and really prepare themselves for life after footy. And I think, as you would well are well aware, there's a lot of mental health issues in today's society and um, especially within elite sports. So to be able to help athletes out from a financial point of view and set themselves up for the future will be able to alleviate that stress somewhat. So I couldn't be enjoying my job more at the moment. It's certainly different from pulling boots on every day <laughs> to putting a suit on and walking into work. But, um, yeah, I'm thoroughly enjoying it and loving sort of that um, balance of being able to help my past teammates and athletes to continue on and also combine that with sort of the financial stuff that I'm really passionate about. Jack, have you run a half marathon recently? I did actually, Mike. Uh, uh, we were sort of doing the pre-season for the footy season this year and unfortunately coronavirus came along and put an end to it at that time. So I wanted to capitalise on the fitness that I had and set myself a little goal and went out and ran a, ran a half marathon encouraged by my sister and um, the aim was to get under 80 minutes and I just snuck under that so um, the next goal might have to be a marathon. Hey Jack, can you raise your left hand? Is that how you normally wear it? <laughs> what happened? You haven't had another injury, yeah. have you? Yeah, I thought giving up footy professionally would uh, put an end to my injuries but um, I play with uh, a few mates at the P Prince Alfred College Old Collegians team in the amateurs over here in Adelaide and unfortunately on the weekend um, I got tackled and thumb went into the ground and I just assumed that I jarred it. Uh, played out the rest of the game and realised that I'd uh, ruptured the ligament in the thumb which required surgery yesterday so um, this certainly isn't a, a feature that I'm trying to run <laughs> with these days. I'm trying to stay away from uh, the surgeons that I've spent too much time with already, but that's all a part of it. And um, at least now in an office job, I can still get to work and won't be missing any days. So um, unfortunate, but it's the way it goes. Well, look, uh, it is unfortunate, but seeing you can't play anymore, maybe you can turn around and just uh, sample the products behind you. Pretty impressive bar you've got there. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, Frederick's bar, and um, who's it's a Frederick? Great little bar, a good friend of mine. Uh, it's the name of the bar. Um, a, a, a good friend of mine um, created this in his house and sort of offered it up for me to do sort of the interview from here. So maybe I will go and pour myself a drink, and <laughs> um, I think my footy season's done. So I can probably have a couple now. Great story, Jack. Thanks for sharing it with us. Too easy. Thanks.